Senator Leas, the uh, public response to this bill is overwhelmingly in opposition, about 10 to 1 uh, leading up to this hearing. Um, it seems, in, in my conversations with some of those who don't like this policy, their concern is particularly around the redefinition of compelling reasons that parents should not be notified that their child is in a, a shelter and the uh, elimination of notice to parents when in a uh, host home. Uh, we might be able to address some of that concern by narrowing the redefinition and uh, new policy language. Would you be open to an amendment that narrows the new definition of compelling reasons and does something about the uh, restriction on notice for host homes? Yeah, I uh, certainly always entertain constructive suggestions about how we can make legislation better. I think uh, the key for me is to ensure that we are using understandable and consistent uh, terminology. The statute already includes definitions for gender affirming care and reproductive health services. So I think uh, using the established definitions that are already in law always uh, provides that clarity and consistency. But uh, will always entertain suggestions and happy to, to take a look at those. Uh, interesting uh, testimony. Uh, you've used the terms unsafe and unsupportive. Uh, will you, are, are those the same or, or are they different? And if they're different, what is the distinction between an unsafe and unsupportive home? Mm. That's an interesting question. I think they can be the same. Um, I think that unsafe can certainly imply violence. And I think that unsupportive can lead to abuse that maybe not everyone would consider unsafe, but unsupportive households can have a severe impact on someone's mental health, leading to the suicide rates that I was talking about. Um, so I don't always think they necessarily mean the same thing in every context. And I think um, in this case, they can lead to the same outcome. Um, all three of you have used the words uh, supportive or affirming repeatedly in your testimony and uh, even said that the lack of affirmation is harm. How is the lack of affirmation harm? And in what sense is the lack of affirmation harm? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question, Representative Walsh. Um, I think as LGBTQ folks up here, um, what we know is that oftentimes when you don't have a supportive home environment as an LGBT person, that can lead to other behavioral health issues. And we have other statistics, such as 40% of um, homeless youth are LGBT, or nearly 50% of trans or non-binary um, folks um, attempting suicide. Um, we think about ways to address, like to lower those barriers. And when you have people supporting pe someone's gender identity or sexual orientation, when they don't have that at home, like we try to find other community, other ways to build community around that young person to reduce those factors. Follow up. Uh, appreciate that. I, that's not really my point. The point of my question is, Affirmation seems to be a rather subjective and high standard of expectation from a family. It is possible to love a person and not affirm everything they're doing. So how do we apply that high standard of affirmation to the law, to public policy, especially if we're going to restrict parental involvement in a child's life? Well, I think a big, a big piece of that um, is when they don't have the supportive home environment, um, part of the host home situation and what gender affirming care is, is that wrap around, around that child. So that ideally, if there's a way to build that barrier back with their um, the caregivers, with their families, there is a bridge to do that. And so, because what we know is that when we surround children, especially LGBTQ youth with supportive and affirming environments, the, the, risk factors for them attempting suicide and other behavioral health issues and homelessness all go down. 